Welcome to Crosspoint. Welcome to Crosspoint. Welcome to Crosspoint. We are an inclusive faith community seeking to live out the loving, just, and generous way of Jesus. We are participants in a long tradition that's less concerned with doctrines and dogma that demand total agreement, but a life to be lived, enjoyed, and given away to others. What unites us is a growing awareness that life is precious, that we are made by love in order to love. This community is comprised of and affirms the entire human family, regardless of race, age, creed, physical abilities, marital or economic status, gender identity, or sexual orientation. So, if you are curious and have come to see, if you are tired and have come to rest, if you are grateful and have come to share, if you are wounded and have come to heal, if you are joyful and have come to celebrate, if you are uprooted and have come to belong, welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home.
greatest love Oh, it's moving all my mountains This perfect love Is casting out my fear How great this love Oh, it welcomes me like family And everywhere I go It meets me there He is good And He is God What I earn Is not what I got He is just Yet oh so kind What I deserve Is not what I find What more could I say about him My God is love How great this love Oh it's faithful through my failures This trust in love is with me to the end. How great this love. Oh, it's closer than a brother. This is love. He died so I could live. He is good. And he is God. Yet oh so kind What I deserve Is not what I find What more could I say about him My God is love He rides into the holy city, entering its gates as king, branches of palms laid at the feet, proclaiming victory, not over conquered people, not over claimed lands nor vanquished enemies, but ending the enmity between God and humanity. 
the evil of othering people for their differences, demonizing the sick and hurting, the diseased and damaged, the ones pushed to the margins by politics and religious power. But by bringing them back into the holy house, the temple made not by stones, but by the flesh and bones of the one who in his body absorbed the hatred, the sickness and sin, the diseases and despair, and gave back love and tenderness, wholeness and healing, compassion and commitment whose domain is not borders and boundaries, countries and nations, not divides between us but the expanse of our hearts, the rule of peace that comes when enfleshing the life of each other, seeing all as sisters and brothers, as neighbor and friend, not as different but as ourselves and another, mirrored as a reflection, the divine spark between us, the Prince of Peace who enters our hearts into the depths of our souls, the holiest of holies, seeing who we are, knowing every part of our being, the beneath the charade and disguises we sometimes make for ourselves, often two-faced and false, Loyalty swaying, branches in the wind. Being unraveled, so what is beneath could come to the surface, to face the light and love, to see ourselves as we truly are. Allied with the one who saw himself rejected and despised, disposable, but remade and rebuilt into a holy house, a sacred temple, body renewed, restored as the cornerstone, the foundation of God's hesed, God's tenacious and everlasting love, extreme love that endures forever. Hello from wherever you're viewing this. I wanna share with you a few ways to get involved in the Crosspoint community. First, if you would like to add your financial contributions to the collective work we get to do in our community, you can find out how to do that at crosspoint.org contribute. We've been able to do some pretty amazing things together and it cannot happen or continue to happen without your support. You can check out multiple ways to support our collective work on the website. We also want to say a really big thank you and wow to those of you who donated items to the Dorcas Ministries food drive. So far, we have completely filled two SUVs full of goods for the pantry. And as you often do, you went above and beyond. And the representative from Dorcas who collected the items was overwhelmed by your generosity. If you still have items you forgot to bring in, feel free to drop them off Monday or next Sunday and we'll be sure to get them to Dorcas. Also, coming up next week is Easter and we will have two identical in-person services at 9 and 11 a.m. 
not the usual 10 a.m. at 9 and 11. If you're viewing online, the service will premiere at its normal time at 10 a.m. If you plan to attend in person, we ask that you register for tickets for anyone who will be in the auditorium. They'll be programming for babies through middle school, so you don't need tickets for them. Tickets are free, but it helps us to better prepare when we know how many people will be attending each service. So again, in-person services next week are at 9 and 11, and you can register for tickets online at crosspoint.org Easter, or you can find the banner on the main page. Also coming up, our children's ministry team is planning a baby dedication this spring. Now, the Crosspoint Family Ministries teams, they work together to plan strategic opportunities for kids and families from birth all the way through high school. And often it starts with baby dedication for families with young children, and then it culminates with senior recognition, which is actually coming up pretty soon as well. Baby dedication is an opportunity to welcome your child into a community where we will invest in positive relationships with your family. It's also a time for you as parents to reflect on how your perspectives, your priorities, your attitudes will provide a guide for your child, who they will become as they grow into the good humans that our world needs. So this year's dedication is gonna be structured differently from baby dedications in the past with the goal that it will allow us a better opportunity to partner with you and to provide more resources for you and your child. So this means that though the baby dedication portion will be held in the service on April 28th, there'll be several gatherings prior to that that we ask you to attend if you'd like to participate. You can find out more. You can register at crosspoint.org slash baby dedication. Last, but definitely not least, I wanna talk with you about something really important. If you've spent any time around our community at all, you know that advocating for justice is a big deal for us. And one part of this is our advocacy for affordable housing in partnership with Habitat for Humanity of Wake County. Now, recently, Habitat has shared two urgent needs. First is the need to protect three manufactured home communities in Apex. These communities are under threat of being sold for redevelopment. And it represents an estimated about 1,000 Apex residents and about 300 manufactured homes. Currently, Apex City plans do not include alternative affordable locations for these residents. And actually, in the latest docu planning documents, their neighborhoods aren't shown on future plans at all. Many of these residents have lived in their neighborhoods for multiple years. These are our neighbors students in our children's classrooms, essential workers, residents whom we interact with every day and who help make our towns the great places that they are. If the land where their homes sit is sold, these residents will currently likely be left with nowhere else in our county that is safe and affordable to live. Because the cost of affordable housing in Wake County is so high, once they're forced from their homes, they're also likely to be forced from their community, from our county, forced into outlying counties and forced to commute further to work, which puts even bigger strain on their checkbook and in their family life. So after conversations with the town council, it's Habitat's goal to get the Apex Town Council to change long-term land use plan to protect manufactured home communities from redevelopment and or build alternative local affordable housing. They're asking faith communities and individuals who live in Apex to sign on to request to the city council to encourage them to consider alternatives. So if you live or work in Apex, you're able to sign on. If you don't live in Apex, but you care about this issue, you can forward the information to friends and family who do live in the town. Additionally, Habitat is asking for anyone who lives in Wake County to sign on to create an affordable housing acquisition fund for Wake County. The long-term goal of this sign-on is to have the county leverage its banking relationships to commit $60 million to a new acquisition fund over several years. It is incredibly evident, and it continues to be evident, that we urgently need more public and private funding to preserve affordable housing and for the unique housing situations like the manufactured housing communities. Many surrounding counties have already put plans in place to help keep housing affordable so that those who work in their county are also able to live here. And that's a goal for Wake County too. The hope is that Wake County will commit to adding the acquisition fund to its budget in fiscal year 27, but we have to prepare for it now.
So why should we care about this? Well, it's a justice family. It's a justice issue. One in four families in Wake and Johnston counties spend too much on their home prices. These issues are directly affecting our neighbors. This is a question of what type of town we want to continue to be. Who will be included? Who and what is valued? And who will we use our voices to protect and lift up? Advocating is a way to let policymakers know that we desire to be a community that is equitable and cares about all people, and that we want to make clear we care about those who can no longer afford to live where they work. It also helps us create an equitable foundation for next generations. It's a way to put love into action, to speak with our voices, to speak for those who don't have a voice, or those who are not often considered by those making the decisions. So if you're an Apex resident and you wanna sign on to the campaign, you can do that right now through the QR code. If you're a Wake County resident and wanna sign on to the Wake County issues, you can do that using this other QR code. There's also paper signups at the guest services area if you're ever there in person. You're welcome to go to habitatwake.org advocacy to read more about the work, about the sign-on campaign and other work that they do. And if you have questions or concerns, feel free to reach out to me at community at crosspoint.org. It's a big deal, Crosspoint. Thank you so much for how you care and how you show love to our community. And I hope that you have a great Easter week. Thanks for listening. Hosanna. That is the traditional word that gets shouted today, uh, echoing that fateful day some 2,000 years ago when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey as crowds lined the streets and waved palm fronds. We're in the last days of Lent and the final preparations for Easter. I have preached Palm Sunday here at Cross Point the past two years, and I feel I've done just about all I can with the story of the donkey and the palm waving crowd and Jesus's triumphal entry into Jerusalem. So when Pastor Jonathan asked me what I was going to preach about today, I foolishly and naively said, how about Judas Iscariot? Here's the thing. A lot of people, because we are busy and because life happens, we skip straight from Palm Sunday to Easter Sunday, from the Hosanna shouting folks lining the road to the uh, life-giving victory of Resurrection Day. A whole lot, though, happens in between. So today we are going to look at a small slice of that whole lot. Um, Judas Iscariot is, of course, as you know, the black sheep of the band of brothers that is the Twelve Apostles. He is the vilified one, the betrayer-in-chief, the true rebel, and the forever renegade, the one who goes down in history as the bad guy. Every storyteller seems to need a bad guy. The text that I've chosen this morning uh, comes from the Gospel according to Luke who gives a somewhat more detailed account of the Last Supper than the other Gospels do. I wish I knew why the different Gospel writers chose to include or exclude what they did, um, but Luke does offer some details that the others do not. So here is Luke's take on the Passover dinner that Jesus shared with his disciples. Listen, dear ones, for what God might have to say to God's people today through the reading of this long ago story. Uh, when the hour came, Jesus took his place at the table and the apostles with him. He said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup and after giving thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he took a loaf of bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he did the same with a cup after supper, saying, This cup 
that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But see, the one who betrays me is with me, and his hand is on the table. For the Son of Man is going as it has been determined, but woe to that one by whom he is betrayed. Then they began to ask one another which one of them it could be who would do this. A dispute also arose among them as to which one of them was to be regarded as the greatest. But Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors, but not so with you. Rather, the greatest among you must become like the youngest, and the leader like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. You are those who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer on you just as my Father conferred on me a kingdom, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and you will sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Simon, Simon, listen, Jesus said. Satan has demanded to sift all of you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your own faith may not fail, and you, when once you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the cock will not crow this day until you have denied three times that you know me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So it's an interesting thing about Judas. You have to piece together the story of his betrayal of Jesus by weaving together details from all the Gospels. Notice that in the Last Supper scene in Luke, he isn't even named, though he is alluded to. And before he does his dastardly deed, we don't actually get to know very much about him at all. John tells us that he's responsible for the disciples' communal funds, and John accuses him, too, of being a thief and not caring about the poor. But beyond that, Judas is something of a blank slate. When you put all the elements of the betrayal story together, it is a kill-for-hire scheme worthy of Dateline NBC, uh, but you have to do that work. Elsewhere, as Luke tells the story, uh, the chief priests and officers of the temple um, were greatly pleased, Luke says, with Judas's willingness to sell out his friend, and they agreed to give him money. But then you have to turn to Matthew to get the price, 30 pieces of silver. Scholars have run the numbers. It is not an enormous amount of money, somewhere between $100 and $500 today, maybe four months of working class wages then. It's a curious thing to me, and maybe a reflection of the culture, that the other gospel writers don't interrogate Jesus's, uh, Judas's motives. Sorry, Judas's motives. Uh, Luke and John say that Satan entered into Judas, and Mark is the most restrained. He doesn't speculate at all. Among the gospel accounts, only Matthew offers us a postscript about Judas after all this happens. Uh, Matthew tells us that Judas repented after Jesus was sentenced to death. I have sinned by betraying innocent blood, Judas says. And he returns his blood money to those who gave it to him. And then before Jesus' crucifixion, Judas hangs himself. Matthew's account adds that the chief priests, knowing the money is tainted, then use it to buy a field that becomes a cemetery for foreigners. Luke actually does come back to the story of Judas, but with a slightly different take, and it doesn't appear in his gospel. Instead, it comes in the other book that he wrote in Acts in the first chapter. And according to Luke there, Judas fell in the field that he had bought with the blood money. He burst open in the middle, it says, and all his bowels gushed out. So these are two very different stories. 
Uh, in one, Judas hangs himself. In the other, he's disemboweled. In one, it is the priests who buy the field. In the other, it is Judas himself. I honestly don't know what to do with the discrepancies between these two accounts. Even in ancient times, uh, people seemed unsatisfied with the details that we got and with this lack of clarity. And if nature abhors a vacuum, as it is said, uh, fiction writers adore one. And so the stories about Judas have grown and grown and grown. In the third century, there was a text that emerged called the Gospel of Judas, which purported to present the whole story from Judas's point of view. And it turns the whole story upside down. It actually makes Judas something of a hero. And the claim is that he was the one who enabled Jesus's ultimate triumph and sacrifice. Uh, the scholar Bart Ehrman uh, writes about another early church text that claims that Judas had a wife and he was so overcome by his guilt that he told her what he had done. So his wife happened to be roasting a chicken as she received Judas's confession. And according to this text, he went on and on saying that he knew Jesus was going to come back from the dead um, and punish him. So his wife laughs in response, and she says that Jesus was no more likely to come back from the dead than the chicken that was turning on the spit at the time um, would. And at that point, allegedly, the roasting chicken spread its wings and squawked three times. It was a miracle so startling that Judas left the house, and then he promptly killed himself. I give you this jumbled mess of data and story in part because it shows us how little we actually know about Judas, how great the gaps are that we choose to fill in with our wild imaginations, and how long people have been struggling to make sense of these stories. Uh, in most cases, though, Judas seems like a means to an end, which is a terrible and transactional way to describe a human being. He is more of an archetype than he is a fully enfleshed person, more of an object lesson than a completely realized character. As I've been working through the biblical stories about Judas, and as I've been wrestling with his place in the story of Jesus that we hold so dear, I've also been struggling with my assumptions and my misconceptions. Why, for instance, did I not remember that Matthew tells us that Judas repented? Why had I never interrogated what it could possibly mean that Satan had entered Judas? I'm not so interested in the weird and the legendary so much as the human and the real. So why had I never stopped to wonder about how deeply human and profoundly real the story of Judas betraying Jesus actually is? The Gospels leave us so much white space to imagine. Why had I never before wondered what might have been happening in his head and what might have been going on in his heart? Maybe it's because I tend to define Judas by the worst thing he ever did. Onto this one sketchy body, I have foisted a heavy burden. That of being not only Jesus's chief betrayer, but also someone against whom I can contrast my own sin, which is surely not as grave as sending our Lord and Savior to the cross. Surely not, right? So I'm not at all trying to minimize the gravity of what Judas does, by no means. I do think, though, that in telling the story as we traditionally have, in black and white rather than in shades of gray, we do him a disservice, and we also glide uh, blithely past two other significant betrayals that are depicted in this morning's text in Luke's gospel. Two other significant incidents as this chosen family gathers for a meal. In addition to the case of Judas, there is the bickering at the table, the unseemly all-too-human bickering um, among the disciples about who among them is the greatest. I don't think this is any small thing. Uh, there, these are, after all, the ones whom Ju Jesus has chosen to be his apostles. The root in the Greek means messenger. These are the people Jesus has chosen to send out into the world with his good news. The ones that Jesus has entrusted with his story of healing and renewal. And here they sit at the table with their teacher, 
jockeying for position and thinking only of themselves. And then there's Jesus's prophecy about what Simon Peter will do, a prediction that leaves this famed and proud apostle defensive and aghast. He insists he would go to prison and even die for Jesus. How does it feel to have a friend who will bluntly call you out on your own BS? Jesus says, before the sun even comes up again, you're going to deny that you even know me. And you're not going to just do it once. You're going to do it three times. With friends like these, is it any wonder that later that night, Jesus took some time for himself to pray? Taken together, we get this devastating picture of how unreliable and fickle Jesus's close friends are. Money, prestige, ego. We witness through the testimony of the Gospels how these omnipresent temptations sway even the ones with whom Jesus has traveled, the ones Jesus has taught, the ones Jesus has loved. We have a suite of human shortcoming, a triptych of selfishness, a stunning collection of me-first thinking that is utterly and unquestionably human. So what about us? What do these three betrayals and the persistent love of Jesus have to do with us? A few months ago, I was in Waco, Texas, uh, working on a story for travel and leisure, and I met with the owners of a wonderful little bookshop called Fabled. And I was asking them about the deeper purpose of the stories that they were offering to their community through what they sell on their bookshelves. And one of them said to me, we want our books to be either windows or mirrors, windows into another's experience or mirrors for self-reflection. In our biblical texts, in these richly textured and complicated stories, like the one that I shared this morning about Jesus' disciples, I think we can find both windows and mirrors if we want to. We can gaze through this window at humanity's persistent patterns, observing how this world offers so many detours and distractions that threaten healthy human relationship. So many obstacles to the flourishing of faithful love. And we can see how even in personal relationship with this great teacher, even in intimate proximity to the one they call their Lord, uh, the disciples still get in their own way, still can't control their own worst impulses, still behave as fallible people. We can also, if we wish and if we're willing, find in these stories a mirror of our own habits and our own heartbreaks. Who among us has not been let down by a friend? Who among us has not disappointed a friend? Who among us has not given in to our desires, our desire for more, our desire to be seen, our desire not to look bad? We are near the end of Lent, which according to the church calendar is a penitential season. For centuries, this has been a uh, traditional time of careful self-examination, of candid reflection on what in our lives might be separating us from flourishing, of thoughtful inquiry into who we have been, who we are now, and who, with the help of God's love, we're becoming. To have these stories of Jesus's feeble friends is, in a sense, a gift, because these aren't just stories about Jesus's friends. They're also stories about Jesus and how he views friendship. They're also stories about how he sticks with them and endures their confusion, knows them better than they know themselves, and loves them through it all. How lucky are we that we've inherited this remarkable picture of how Jesus's love persists, even in the midst of his friend's utter unreliability. In John's version of the Last Supper story, there's a line that has lodged in my heart. Aistelos egapesen autos. He loved them to the end. Jesus loved his friends to the end. Uh, that Greek phrase, aistelos, is an interesting one. You know you're going to get at least a moment of word geekery in every sermon I offer, right? Because yes, aistelos means to the end, but it also means more than that. 
it can also mean to completion or to wholeness or to perfection. In other words, Jesus loved his friends to the end of his life, sure, but he also loved them completely in that way that divine love can heal. And he loved them unabashedly. And the interesting thing is that John does not say that he loved only the ones that loved him well. Not at all. He just loved them, fickle them, unreliable them, backstabbing them, awkward them, egotistical them, sinful them, human them. The Last Supper, where so much drama unfolds, surely surpasses even your worst family dinners, doesn't it? I find the jockeying for position to be painfully relatable. I think of the kids asking who might be the favorite or who gets the best chair, and maybe the adults doing the same, uh, but either under their breath or in their own hearts. In most families, there is probably the goody two-shoes, the Simon Peter, who could never imagine setting a foot wrong. For most of us, I would imagine, I would hope, that the murder is only metaphorical or aspirational and the betrayals that emerge over a meal with loved ones never result in actual physical killing, I hope. And through all this mess, Jesus loved them. Jesus loved them to the end. Jesus loved them completely. Jesus loved them to wholeness. Jesus loved them perfectly. Taken all together, these messy and complicated stories about relationship and chosen family are, yes, both a window and a mirror, a window into the dire possibilities of being human, and a mirror uh, that shows us what we might do and probably have already done. We have sold out our Lord. We have wondered about our own power and prestige. We have betrayed the one we call our God. And still, Jesus loved his friends to the end, and Jesus loves us to the end, completely, to wholeness, perfectly. Judas, Simon Peter, the others, you, me. At the Last Supper, Jesus urged his disciples to remember him and his love establishing the template for the meal that we now regularly share and setting the table for the communion feast that we'll partake of in a few minutes. Isn't it striking how even as Jesus urged them to remember, they so quickly forgot? Today is the day when the church traditionally proclaims Hosanna. It has become an announcement of glory, a shout of acclamation. But its roots are actually in the Hebrew, and in the Jewish tradition, Hosanna isn't so much a word of praise as it is a cry for help. Perhaps the story of Judas, really the story of all the hapless disciples, and maybe us, perhaps the story of Judas has been handed down to us as a memento of the messiness of humanity. Perhaps their example, their fickleness, their confusion, but also their devotion and their trust should compel a different kind of Hosanna, one that harkens back to the original, one that joins the ancient chorus that acknowledges our neediness and testifies to our trust in God's overwhelming love. Perhaps their betrayals in word and in deed can remind us that we need something beyond ourselves, rescue, even salvation. Hosanna, save us from ourselves, Hosanna, Save us from hurting others. Hosanna, save us from the worst of our inclinations and turn us toward the good. Hosanna, save us for the sake of love. Amen.
When I survey the wondrous cross on which the would like to know more or get connected to Crosspoint, go to crosspoint.org. If you're in need of care or assistance, go to crosspoint.org slash care. And welcome home 